Look at everybody there. So glad to see you all. I'm Stephanie Wiseman, um, artistic director and founder of The Marsh and now Marsh Stream. And we're so glad tonight to have Solo Arts Heal. And we're uh, showcasing Adam Strauss, a wonderful Marsh performer and uh, a solo arts healer at that. But before we start, let's talk a little bit about what's happening on the Marsh stream. Uh, so tomorrow at noon, we have Don Reed in the Zumba, as in Z-O-O-O-M-B-A room. And we're going to be, uh, Don's going to be teaching us a little bit about some uh, great tips on how to be on Zoom and perform and get great shots and forwards and backwards. So we're thrilled about that at noon. And then at 7.30, it's mine, my Stephanie's Marsh stream. And I am having getting the great and wonderful honor to uh, interview Robert Townsend. Robert Townsend of Hollywood Shuffle fame and all the fame he has. And he's just a wonderful person. And we got to produce his show, Living the Shuffle, for months at the Marsh in Berkeley. That's Thursday night. Then on Friday, we have Candace CJ Sings. And we're going to be having our singing lessons and fitness class at the same time. Uh, uh, Friday night, we have Bingo with Josh Kornbluth. And on Saturday and Sunday, we have Wayne Harris's May Day Parade. He'll be doing it live on Saturday at 4.30. And we'll be rebroadcasting it with, at 7.30. And we'll do it live again at 2 p.m. And we'll have a Q&A. But now what we're really here for, oh, did I forget to talk about the tip jar? Support us. Support us through the tip jar. We're doing all these shows every night at 7.30, youth programs at 4 o'clock, our training and learning and interesting classes uh, at um, noon. And we have no ticket sales at the Marsh anymore, and you all know why. So if you want to support us with a donation, just click on the tip jar. But now I want to hand this over to the inimitable, wonderful Gail Shickley, who is going to host this show. Thank you all so much for being part of the Marsh Stream tonight and Solo Arts Heals. See you later. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here and to be part of the Marsh Stream. You've had such a great um, few weeks opening and every show has been wonderful. I've enjoyed many of them. And um, I've enjoyed all the ones I've seen, I should say. And, uh, and now we have um, Solo Arts Heal. And um, this is a show where solo performers present real life empowering stories um, that we hope are transformative experiences for audiences. Um, the artists that we are showcasing are themselves survivors or caregivers of particular uh, illnesses or, or um, uh, in tonight's case, OCD uh, challenges that have brought them to write about them. They've become their own advocates and offering hope and inspiration for audiences. And tonight is no exception. Um, tonight, I'm so pleased to welcome Adam Strauss, um, who is a writer and comedian based in New York. Um, and he's going to be performing the Mushroom Cure excerpts. Um, the Mushroom Cure is Adam's true story about his attempt to treat his debilitating OCD with psychedelics. It was developed and directed by Jonathan Libman. It has had extended sold out runs in New York, Chicago, and at the Marshes San Francisco and Berkeley theaters. The Chicago Tribune called it arrestingly honest and howlingly funny. The New York Times said it mines a great deal of laughter from disabling pain. And Time Out New York called it a true life tour de force and named it Critics Pick. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Adam Strauss with an excerpt from The Mushroom Cure. There's the iPod, and there's something called the I River. They're both sitting on my desk, and they're both playing the same song on repeat. I have my headphones on, and I'm switching the plug of the headphone 
from one MP3 player to the other, just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And, and I queue up different songs in different genres, different instruments, different vocal ranges and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And after two days, it's clear. It's clear. I mean, the I River sounds better. Overall, the iPod, it does have a little bit more nuance in the mid range, but the I River has this, this sort of richness to it. It's just more full body. And so, good, good, good. You're keeping the I River. This is done. This is done. Just, just return the iPod right now. And I'm slipping the iPod back into the box. And the box itself, the way it's hinged, it, it reminds me of a jewel box which is fitting in a way because the iPod with those curved chrome edges melding seamlessly into that minimalist white face, it's, it's beautiful. It's sensual. I, I kind of want to lick it. Whereas the I river, well, it, it's made in Korea, South Korea. I assume though, maybe it's North. I mean, this thing, it looks communist. It's this stout utilitarian slab studded with switches and dials and knobs and buttons. And, and people get mugged for their iPod. No one's going to mug you for an iRiver. If they tried, you just bludgeon them with it. Yeah, but it's going to be tucked away in your pocket 90% of the time. The aesthetics of this device are irrelevant. Yes, but the iPod's battery is better. I mean, that's not irrelevant. Who cares how good the iRiver sounds if you can't actually turn the thing on? Yeah, but the iRiver gets eight hours per charge. You've never listened to more than eight hours of continuous music in your life, but you've also never had an MP3 player before. Now that you have your entire collection at your fingertips, you're going to be listening to music a lot more. Eight hours may not be enough. Yeah, 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 you're gonna be listening. That's the key word, listening, because it's an audio player. Audio quality is the paramount consideration. You've made your decision, just, just stick with your decision, but there has to be a reason. No one lines up for days outside the iRiver store. Just, just keep the iPod, man. Everyone else loves their iPods. Just you'll be happy with the iPod. Yeah, but the sound quality. Yes, but the battery life and the user interface. You know what, man? Just pick, one. Just pick either one. It's not worth the suffering. Just, just pick either one, but I pick the right one, pick the right one, pick the right one, pick the right one. And finally, I turn to the place I always turn when I'm utterly lost and desperate. Google. And I type in OCD cures. Well, I type in OC and Google auto populates D cures. I've Googled that phrase obsessively, and, and, and there's medications Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Xanax, Effexor, Lamictal. I've been on every single one of these. Lexapro, I'm taking 80 milligrams of that one. Next page, psychotherapies, exposure response prevention, flooding, psychodynamic, cognitive behavioral. I've done all of this too. Next page, yoga. I did that for two years. Meditation. I stuck with that one for five years because if I could just attain enlightenment, then everything would be perfect. If I could just attain enlightenment, that everything would be perfect. If I could just attain enlightenment, that everything would be perfect. That's not technically a mantra. But hypnotism, homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal remedies. There has to be something I haven't tried. Next page. Next page. Midway down the page, there's a link that's still in that pristine virginal blue. It hasn't been in purple by my previous click. Click. The Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, a pilot study of a new experimental medication for obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't have time to read all this. Where are the results? Where are the results? Where are the conclusions? With a single dose, every patient experienced significant remission of OCD symptoms. In some cases, the changes seem permanent. What is this stuff called? Psilocybin. Highlight, right click, search. Psilocybin is the active compound in hallucinogenic mushrooms. So, I call my weed dealer slow. That's his name. Though, in fairness, slow is slow. I mean, slow walks slow. Slow talks slow. Slow somehow manages to deliver marijuana with astounding rapidity. But in every other respect, slow fully embodies his moniker, which is spelled simply S-L-O. Uh, because when you're as slow as slow, you can't afford to take the time to get to that terminal W. And slow finally picks up the phone the way he always picks up the phone, the last possible ring. Yo, dog, what's happening, son? I'm not doing a bad stereotype black accent, by the way. A slow is white. He does a bad stereotype black accent. My rendition was flawless, I assure you. Yeah, slow. Yeah, no, no, I'm good on weed, man. No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm looking for mushrooms. Well, how quickly can you get them? Yeah, but I mean, don't you know someone who has them, like, like a colleague or someone? 
No one in New York, man. I have trouble. Yeah, I guess there are growing seasons slow, but come on, this is not an exotic request. No, I, I, I don't want ecstasy. No, I definitely don't want ketamine, man. It has to be mushrooms. It doesn't make a difference why slow. Listen, I have been a very loyal customer for a very long time. If you can't come through for me on this, I kind of have to reevaluate this entire relationship here. No, no, slow, don't hang up. I'm asking you to do me a favor, okay? It's not even a favor. I'll get a lot of them, man. Are you really going to try, though? I mean, today, tomorrow, as soon as possible. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever it costs, I'm just, I'm counting on you here, man. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's totally fine. All right. No, no, I, I appreciate it. I really do so. No, I don't care how good your ketamine is. Bye. Fucking slow, man. Fucking slow. <sighs> Fuck it. I go to Times Square and I start barking. Stand up comedy. We got 8:30, 10:30, midnight show times, half price covered with a free flyer tonight. Jim Gaffigan headline. Barking. Uh, barkers are indigenous to the Times Square region of New York City. I should probably clarify that. They're probably the most loathed subspecies of New Yorker, uh, which is clearly saying something, but I mean, they deserve it. The way, the way they approach prospects and just plead for their patronage. Oh, hey, we got a great stand-up comedy show for you tonight. We got, we got Chris Rock. We got Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, you look like you need a laugh. Well, guess what? I got the ticket right here. Get it? Tickets? Where are you going? I don't do that shit, though. Now, I have a different technique. I simply stand in the most high traffic area in all of Times Square, almost invariably in front of the Hershey store. I shout my sales pitch and I wait for my audience to come to me. It's both less humiliating and far more efficient. We got stand up comedy tonight. It's 8.30, 10.30, midnight show times. Great lineup tonight. It's half price cover the free flyer. Stand up comedy. We got Jim Gaffigan headlining, stand up comedy, great lineup, stand up comedy, half price cover. And then I see him. And it's a Friday. I mean, Times Square is throng, so something about her must stand out. I think paradoxically, it's her plainness. She's she's really cute, maybe even beautiful, but in this very wholesome way, something about her seems pure. Like she's this farm girl set loose amidst these frantically flashing five-story high video displays of animated m and &M. And I watch her walk towards me. She picks her way past the guy squawking out white Christmas on his alto saxophone, even though it's fucking May. And then she has this knot of people clustered at the entrance to the Hershey store which is in a state of perpetual gridlock because the width of the doorway is wildly inadequate for the clientele. And then, did she go into the Hershey store? That's disappointing. But no, I, I peer through the plate glass window. She's not inside there, so she has to be right there. Unless, Did you lose her? Did you seriously lose her? Dude, she was standing 10 feet away from you. You're just waiting here like the universe is gonna deliver her to you? Why didn't you walk over to her, you idiot? Hey, she's standing right next to me. So what's this show tonight? Oh yeah, it's it's, it's a great lineup tonight. It, it's it's a bunch of famous comics plus me. I'm, I'm Adam, I'm Grace. So you stopped in Times Square. You're you're a tourist. Yeah, I'm, I'm visiting from Kansas. Wow, that's that's kind of exotic here. Are are you in school? Well, I, I just graduated, but yeah, I'm moving to California in the fall for grad school for psychology. That's why I'm here for a conference. That that was my college major. I, I almost went to grad school for psychology myself. Well, um. Here, I take a flyer. It, it starts in 20 minutes. She's straight up Broadway, left on 53rd. I really hope you can make it. 
yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll I'll see you there. <sighs> All right. All right, she's gonna come. You didn't fuck it up. Well no, you did fuck it up. You got lucky, but but she's gonna come. Except she may not come. She may not come. She could just be being polite. I mean, she's from Kansas. People do that there. Or no, no, she seems sincere. She probably intends to come, but fuck around, man. She, she's going to get waylaid by barkers from competing comedy clubs or the legions of Nigerians unfurling their white bed sheets laden with knockoff Gucci purses. Wait, wait, wait. You sent a girl, you sent a girl from Kansas loose into the wilds of Times Square and you expect her to make it six blocks? Why didn't you walk her there? You have to go back yourself anyway in, in what, seven minutes? Jesus Christ, man. You get a second chance and you fuck that up too, you fucking idiot. Fuck. But since we're short on time, we're going to jump ahead. I will say Grace did come to that show. When I walk into the club, she's sitting in the front row and that particular comedy set goes well. And Grace and I start a fairly intense long distance relationship. But the OCD does not go away. We have quite a few psychedelic experiences together and some of them seem quite transformative, but the OCD keeps popping up and eventually it forces Grace and I apart. And I still can't find mushrooms, man. I can't find mushrooms. Apparently there's some sort of post-burning man mushroom drought happening right now. It's ridiculous. But finally, through the dark web via this shady Peruvian vendor, I do find mushrooms. But when this particular batch of mushrooms arrives in the mail, I am extremely disappointed because they look nothing like penises. Uh, they're supposed to look like penises. I should probably clarify that. This particular mushroom strain that I'd ordered is called penis envy, and they're bred specifically to emulate the appearance of male genitalia. And in the pictures I'd seen online, there was a thick, meaty stem with a little cap pulled over to the tip. They look exactly like a circumcised member, but these mushrooms, these mushrooms, they're, they're twisted and shriveled and mottled. They look like some sort of horrible industrial accident victim pieces. And plus they're small. And I tell myself size doesn't matter, but <sighs> fuck it. I take all of them. I mean, they're probably impotent anyway. Actually, they turn out to be quite virile. And I should clarify something. I don't call 911 because I want the cops to come to my house. I call because I have some burning existential questions and no one else is picking up their phone. And my memory of this whole experience is admittedly hazy, but one of the benefits of calling 911 at the peak of an amnesia-inducing psychedelic experience is that you can subsequently request a transcript for $8. This is a very short excerpt from a very long transcript. Operator. 911, this call is being recorded. What is the nature of your emergency? Caller. Are, are you God? Excuse me, sir? Or am I God? Sir, what's your address? I don't know if I should tell you that. And suddenly, Everything blooms into pixels. The, the bookshelf, the desk, the painting of the matador hanging above the desk, they all look like they're being rendered in one of those ancient Atari video games in the pixels. They start to smear and warp into these, these pulsating blobs. There's this heaving brown amoeboid mass for the bookcase, a slithering silver undulation for the desk, the painting. It starts to pinwheel out these glistening red globs that, that quiver arrhythmically in the air. Sir, where are you located? Is anyone with you? Hello, hello, is anyone there? Is anyone there at all? Hello, hello. And now white begins to flood in from the edges of my visual field. It's exactly like the end of one of those old Warner Brothers cartoons where you have black closing in on a shrinking circular aperture, but this is pure, merciless white. It obliterates everything and then nothing. No sight, no sensory awareness at all, just dark. 
and then the darkness starts to assume a shape. It starts to gather at the horizon into this, this wave, and this wave rises up higher and higher and higher and higher until the droplets frothing at its crest, they, they begin to coalesce. They start to resolve themselves into a single impossibly sharp point. As that point begins to bear down on me, I can see reflected its myriad facets. Oh God, no, 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 no. It's myself. It's my, my rage, my vanity, my ruthlessness, just, just needing to feel good or no, 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 not needing, not needing, just wanting and not caring who I heard in the process hurting Annie, hurting Grace, hurting everyone who's ever loved me, or no, caring, caring, you care, you care quite a bit, but you do it anyway, you do whatever the fuck you want anyway, because the tip of the wave is barred with the horrible truth I've only secretly known that my core is shot through with this monstrous, monstrous selfishness, and now I'm going to pay for my sins, and it's not just the principle to, oh no, there's decades of interest to hurt, no, please, no, please, 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 no, please, no, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing I can do, I'm powerless. So, okay, okay then, okay, 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 here I am, do it, bring it the fuck on. I'm the wind. I'm the darkness and the light. They're the same. They've always been the same. I'm the whole universe. With each step forward, my hallway pitches and heaves like I'm on a ship in heavy swells. I reach out, grab the knob. This creature is standing in the doorway, a, a cyborg with thick cables protruding out of either side of its neck and running down into its chest. Wait, that, that's a stethoscope. You're real? Yeah, buddy, I'm real okay, says the paramedic as he steps inside. Have you ever taken mushrooms? Never alone. Suddenly, two cops materialize in the doorway. They look a bit like penis mushrooms themselves, with their small blue caps stretched taut atop their wide heads. You need a hand with this one, Joel? Not sure. Two more cyborgs arrived and three more penises were all just crowded into my front hallway. And I realize we've all been assembled here for a reason. Well, I say, let's all sit down together and try to figure this whole thing out, I guess. The phalanx of emergency responders docilely follow me into the living room. The cops sink into the couch, the paramedics congregate in the corner, and a silence descends as everyone looks up at me expectantly. I'm the one who's been chosen to channel this momentous message. <clears throat> <clears throat> My, my mouth is dry. Whoa, 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 what are you doing there? What, what am I doing? I'm just having some water. You can't have any water. I can't have any water? We don't know what you've taken. You can't take anything else until we get you to the ER. Now, now put down that water. But water? I mean, I still need water. Otherwise, I could get dehydrated. If I get dehydrated, I, I could die. I, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I, I need to drink this water right now. You're not going to die, buddy. That's why we're taking you to the hospital. Now put down the water. The paramedic, his teeth are these twisted green shards. They, they look like moss-covered tombstones. He wants to conduct experiments on me. No. No, I, I am not putting down this water and I am not going anywhere with you. And, and I want you to get out of my house right now. All of you, get out of here right now. The cops begin to crowd in on me. One of the other paramedics, a slight middle-aged woman, is suddenly between me and the cops. Listen, 
listen carefully, okay? Because you have a choice to make right now. Either you can come with me or the officers are going to take you. But how do I know I can trust you? You can trust me. And in her eyes, I can see all of the sadness she's ever experienced. But you got to choose now, otherwise they're going to make that choice for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That was wonderful. Uh, it's just a very powerful performance. I've seen your show several times and it always amazes me the uh, incredible energy you have and it makes me laugh and cry it just you really put yourself out there i'm sure an exhausting performance at the at the end of it well, you won the new york fringe festival overall excellent award for best solo performance and also an eddie award in, in san francisco for eight, best solo was, show i think right the marsh performance the first marsh run yeah oh excellent well, um, in a few moments, um, to extend this conversation about your show and um, about the use of psychedelics, um, we're going to welcome Madison Margolin, founder of psychedelic magazine uh, Double Blind, and Danielle Negrin, executive director of the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. But first, I want to remind our audience that you can find the tip jar in the chat to support the Marsh and Adam in these wonderful shows. And um, and uh, I'm going to introduce the other guests and and turn this over to Adam for a longer discussion on the subject of which you're so pro profoundly versed. So um, Danielle Negrin is the executive director of San Francisco Psychedelic Society and on the founding team of Decriminalized Nature Oakland. Danielle specializes in building conscious community, providing psychedelic education, harm reduction, and addiction recovery services. Danielle's focus is on integrating entheogens or chemical substances, typically of plant origin, to aid and accelerate mental health, trauma recovery, personal development, and freedom from problematic substance abuse behaviors. Danielle believes in sacred intentional practice and the potential to making a better world possible for ourselves, our communities, and our earth. Welcome, Danielle. And Madison Margolin is the co-founder and managing editor of Double Blind, a biannual print magazine and digital media company at the forefront of a rapidly growing psychedelic movement. Also a Los Angeles, New York based journalist, Margolin covers psychedelics, cannabis, drug policy and spirituality in jest, Jews and drugs. She's written for Playboy magazine, Rolling Stone, Nylon, Vice, LA Weekly, High Times, Tablet, and others. A graduate of Columbia Journalism School and UC Berkeley, Margolin has traveled everywhere from pot farms in the Emerald Triangle to the shores of the Ganges River and all over Israel, Palestine, exploring the role of plant medicine in religion, mental health, and conflict resolution. Welcome to you both. For having us. Ah, very good. And Adam, I'd like to turn this over, over to you to continue a discussion. And um, after a little while, we can op open it up for audience Q&A. Sounds great. And thank you so much, Gail. Gail has been uh, really the, dri the driving force behind this whole Art Seals thing and has worked tirelessly to bring this. What, what you just saw tonight was really Gail's uh, handiwork in terms of structuring this whole thing the last two weeks and, and continuing to bring a lot of really great programming, as Gail said at the beginning, focused on healing, survivorship, and solo performance. So that this is uh, this is Gail's brainchild. So thank you, Gail, for giving me this opportunity. And of course, to the Marsh, just a very quick word there that, um, yeah, I first did the Marsh in 2017. I will say it's also thanks, thanks to Gail. Gail's the one who got me in there. And it's been really the highlight of my year. Each of the last three years has been coming out and performing at the Marsh in San Francisco and or Berkeley, um, 2017, 18, and 19. And in fact, right now, I was slated to be performing at, um, we were going to do San Francisco and then switch over to Berkeley. So this is, I suppose, the next best thing. But really, there's, I, I do solo theater all over the world, and there's no other theater 
I perform that is as dedicated to solo artists and gives them the level of support and community that the Marsh does. So I, I encourage people to certainly support uh, via the tip jar. Uh, there's other ways to support the Marsh, but it's just a vital and really unique resource. There's nothing else in the world in the world of solo performance like the Marsh. So it's uh, selfishly important to me that they continue to survive and thrive through these very challenging times. Um, so with that, yeah. And also thank you very much to Danielle and, and Madison for joining me. The, I'm so excited to have both of you, given that you really have pretty pioneering roles in this world that is evolving so quickly, the world of psychedelic medicine. So I had some questions for each of you. I guess I'll start with Danielle. Um, Danielle sort of has home field advantage here, as it were, in the Bay Area. Uh, as the executive director of, of the SF Psychedelic Society, and as part of that, you really spearheaded this whole decriminalized movement, which, I mean, uh, uh, frankly, I'm surprised how quickly it's taken off. And I won't talk too much about it. You can talk more about it. But essentially, um, I don't remember exactly what happened, but Oakland decriminalized hallucinogenic mushrooms and other plant medicines uh, which was, yeah, a, a real milestone event. I believe Berkeley has two now, and it's spreading to cities throughout the country and throughout the world. So, um, yeah, so my, my question for you is, well, first, can you define decriminalization? Because there's a lot of terms being bandied about in terms of legalization, recreational use. Uh, so what exactly is decriminalization for those who aren't familiar? And um, <clears throat> looking at my notes here. Oh yeah. And, and really what, what is your ultimate goal? Where do you see this going in terms of the legal status of psychedelics over, over the coming years, Danielle? Thanks Adam. And thanks to Gail and the Marsh for hosting me here. Um, so I'm part of Decriminalized Nature Oakland and we are a group that wrote a resolution to deprioritize uh, the the use of psychedelics in Oakland. And um, basically this means that it's the lowest priority for the police and no government funding will go towards arresting anyone for possessing entheogenic plants and fungi for distributing or cultivating. And the psychedelics that were deprioritized in Oakland are, there were hundreds of different psychedelics, um, all plant-based schedule one, mainly iboga, ibogaine, uh, ayahuasca, psilocybin mushrooms, peyote, and uh, San Pedro cactus. It left out um, schedule two, which would be opiates and pop, uh, opium and poppy, and, as well as coca. And um, basically the resolution allows people to gather, grow, and gift in Oakland. You just cannot sell or commodify the plants and fungi. And um, we're seeing this resolution spread to over 100 cities throughout the country. And Santa Cruz just decriminalized, which is or deprioritized. It's labeled as decriminalization, but it's actually not full decriminalization. It's just this lowest priority for the police. It's still federally illegal, and um, it's it's just a, a stepping point. And we hope our intention with this is to. Um, to really destigmatize plant medicine and fungi medicine within the U.S. and hopefully, what will come with that is, uh, you know, people will start to have access to this medicine. It's it's healed my addiction personally, and it's helped mental health. You know, as you've seen with Adam, and it's really been a catalyst for change in our country and our world with humans. And I'd like to see this momentum that we're gaining with decriminalizing these plants and fungi. Uh, be furthermore helping uh, free the war on drugs. You know, we, we're amongst a time where people are still going to prison for uh, dealing with their consciousness. Um, and it's a really unique time to be alive. And we're really at this nexus point right now where we have the opportunity to create change that we would like to see before it happens to us. And that's really the work I'm focused on right now is uh, cultivating change within our community that's rippling out to the global world. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, well put. And it does seem like, um, yeah, just it, it, in reference to the whole war on drugs, I saw this, uh, a, a friend of mine who worked for the Soros Open Society Drug Initiative posted something today where the first two prisoners who have died in federal prison in this country were both in prison for nonviolent drug offenses. 
So just kind of highlighting just the, the unintended horrific consequences of, of the war on drugs. Exactly. Yeah. And just to follow up, Danielle, so, so do you have a sense? It's, it's hard to know how this is going to play out because clearly things are evolving so quickly in the psychedelic space. I mean, I was, again, I was surprised how quickly and how broadly decriminalized was embraced. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised given it is the Bay Area, but you're also seeing it spread all over the place. So do you feel like this is, um, like you, do you think the, this is something that might, because as you pointed out, there's a distinction between decriminalization, it's the stuff is still illegal at the federal level. And that sort of ambiguity I know we've seen with cannabis, where you, you'll have people who are doing things that are legally sanctioned in, locally, but then the federal government may raid their farm and arrest them. So do you have a sense of how, how this may play out on the federal level? That's a really great question, Adam. I'm, I'm unsure how it'll play out on the federal level. I do know that Oakland City Council is wanting uh, for, to further the resolution to allow for commodification and sales of psychedelics within Oakland. They're actually hungry for that. Um, I also think that, you know, in the past five years, there were only eight arrests for psilocybin in Oakland. So it wasn't actually a big issue. We don't see people getting arrested for ayahuasca or, or mushrooms or a cactus. So it's, it's dealing with a problem that's not a huge problem to begin with. So I would like, I, I would hope that the federal government would see, you know, we're putting all this tax money um, and resources into something that's not actually an issue to begin with. So let's deep, let's figure out our priority with where we are putting our, our funding and, um, and get, and not put it towards criminalizing people. Yeah. So it, it seems like part of the benefit of, and, and part of maybe what's behind your strategy and decriminalized strategy is not so much, oh, wow, we have, because so many people are getting called into, called into jail for, for mushrooms and open, we need to fix that problem. It's more, this is a way to kind of move the ball forward legally and maybe even a little bit of like an opening salvo in the sense of saying, hey, if the federal government is, is going to cling to, to betray my own bias here, a wildly illogical and harmful policy, well, it's gonna be left to local governments to try to adopt a more sane approach. Exactly. And yeah. I, th I think it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. Um, I'm, I hope that because I hope that it won't get to a place where there's a lot of focus on, you know, corporate money, commodification and sales and uh, that whole route that we've seen cannabis go down. Um, you know, I don't think that everyone is going to have access to this medicine and have access to this healing until people are out of prison. Um, so we have to keep the keep it equal for everyone that's in the field. Yeah, yeah, no, and these are all things that, I mean, hopefully, and, and this actually, we can pivot to Madison with this. So I have another question for you, Madison. Ho hopefully the psychedelic movement learns from some of the pitfalls that we've seen with cannabis. Um, though it's, it's unclear at this stage. And yeah, no, I, I, we, and we, we, can, we can certainly talk more about that, I guess. So Madison, I had a couple of questions for you. Um, just reviewing my, yeah. Um, well, yeah, let's let's go with this one. Um, just for what I just said to Danielle, I mean, how do you see, so you've covered uh, for, for, you know, some fairly mainstream press as well, cannabis and psychedelics. How do you see this all proceeding? Do you see psychedelics following sort of a similar path as cannabis towards, uh, you know, medical or maybe more limited legalization and then more recreational use? Or do you think it'll be a, a different game with psychedelics? What's your sense of that? Yeah, so I do see, you know, I think I always say sometimes that cannabis is a gateway plant. And what I mean by that is it's kind of priming people like the general public to be more accepting of plant medicine and you know, cannabis itself is somewhat of a psychedelic too. So it's kind of an intro to psychedelics and I think is shifting the conversation forward. So there are a few ways that I see this going, you know, with the cannabis movement specifically, it started with medical marijuana. And then we saw that as a domino effect, almost like throughout the country. And then we started seeing also adult use um, programs in you know, California, Colorado, et cetera. Um, 
with psychedelics, it's a little bit different because we have two concurrent uh, parts of the movement happening. So we just spoke about the decriminalized nature um, movement, which, you know, there are initiatives in, you know, Chicago, uh, Dallas, all, all over the country, we have initiatives that are aiming to replicate uh, what happened in Oakland. Um, and then we also have uh, federal research happening um, at an FDA approved level, so at the federal level. So organizations like MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, um, Johns Hopkins, uh, Compass, which is a for-profit company developing psilocybin. Um, these, these organizations are all um, pursuing a clinical research looking at specifically MDMA for PTSD and psilocybin for major depressive disorder. Um, and so those two, uh, synth that, so the synthetic versions of psilocybin and MDMA have been fast tracked by the FDA to become approved medications in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, probably within the next couple of years. So at the federal level, they, you know, we will see psychedelics rescheduled, um, but that's not necessarily legal for general adult use, which is why it's also so important to have the grassroots movements uh, cropping up all over the place. Um, I think what was, what else was I going to add? Um, one thing is also we're seeing ketamine clinics, um, which is legal for sort of off use, off label, um, use, uh, also prop cropping up everywhere. Um, and then just as in terms of like the public sort of being open and receptive to this as a movement in general, I like to sort of equate microdosing psychedelics to sort of the CBD movement in that it's a step into like, you know, without having to take a full dive into a psychedelic trip, you can microdose LSD or psilocybin just as you would take CBD and maybe not have a full psychoactive experience, but start to feel a little bit more comfortable um, with the medicine. So, I mean, that's not to say I, I don't necessarily advocate for microdosing in place of Tripping, I think tripping has a lot of value also, um, but depending on like whether you're trying to convince your grandmother to try psilocybin, maybe start with a microdose. Yeah, don't, don't give grandma five grams to, off the bat, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> um, to, and I, yeah, no, and th thanks for outlining that. It, it does, uh, I'd never heard that analogy between microdosing and CBD, but I, I like that. And I did have a follow question just prompted by our bio that, that reference to, to Jews and drugs. And this is an area that I have a lot of personal interest in, the sort of relationship between religions, re, well, religion specifically and psychedelics, also spirituality and psychedelics. And that's something that I've, I've seen explored more than religion per se. And it, uh, I know you had, you had mentioned in sort of an offline conversation, one tie in there is this role of what term mystical experience in, in like the Hopkins research, the role that this transformative mystical experience may play in, in the healing that we're seeing in these, these FDA approved clinical trials, mm -hmm. specifically for psilocybin. I, I don't think that we're, we're they're, they're measuring that with the MDMA work as much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do like to joke that, I mean, it's not a joke. Um, I do say sometimes that Judaism and other religions too are sort of an expression of altered states, right? So, you know, the, the incense in like the ancient temple had, um, was made with a recipe that included acacia wood, which is known to have DM, DMT and um, kane buzzum, which is cannabis. Um, you know, Hinduism too, like hashish has been part of the, the religion um, for Shiva devotees and um, so, you know, a lot of religions have developed rituals around the use of psychoactive plants, um, but specific to the mystical experience. Um, so it's actually, so it's this criteria that uh, psychedelic scientists have come up with. It's sort of seven different, um, seven different criteria. It's like sense of oneness, um, an ineffable quality, meaning like you can't really describe the experience with words, a sense of sacredness, um, you know, different um, standards and they've seen that the magnitude of healing uh, often correlates with the magnitude of mystical experience, which I think is really valuable in sort of bridging this quote unquote divide that we're seeing between like recreational use and medical use and showing that wellness is something that kind of 
is more holistic than even, you know, like the medical marijuana versus adult use marijuana, like what we've, what we've seen in public policy so far. So, you know, I think what's really fascinating about this is psychedelics is the coming together of like religion or spirituality, science and the law um, to sort of push, push us forward. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. And I mean, this is, we could talk for hours about the, the, this stuff, particularly the, the mystical experience thing. It's uh, you know, my own experience since obviously I, I didn't do the full show, but ultimately, well, and I, sh and I, I, I probably should address this a little bit just for the, the general audience. My, my own experience has been that that mystical experience is important, though I'm not sure if that was the key thing for me. A, a lot of the way psychedelics help me certainly I view OCD as an addiction in a lot of ways, which is not that's not something I made up. That's that's a, a, a generally accepted um, psychological lens through which to view OCD. The idea being that it's an attempt to avoid pain that creates more pain, and therefore that greater pain gives you more of an incentive to engage in the behavior. Essentially, the more like an alcoholic, when they take a drink, they may feel better for a little bit. The drink wears off, they feel even worse. So that gives them the increasing incentive to continue drinking. And of course, over time, what happens is your life gets more and more out of control because you're drunk all the time. You're engaging in OCD rituals all the time. And it does seem like psychedelics have a lot of utility in general with addiction. Um, that's certainly been part of the psilocybin work. They've studied it for alcoholism, for smoking cessation, probably other stuff as well. And for me, part of the, the mystical experience element came into play by having an experience of, it's impossible to put it in words, but if I had to, I'd say connection beyond, connection to something beyond myself, whether that is, some people could call that God, other people could say it's nature. You could even say, oh, I'm just connecting to a deeper part of myself. And I don't think you can know the answer. So I don't get too hung up on that. But that, that was important in giving me sort of a degree of trust to let go because OCD is about controlling everything. And there's this fear that, well, if I let go of control, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen and that's terrifying. So that experience was very helpful there. But psychedelics also helped me at a sort of more prosaic level in that I understood intellectually that if I could, if I was willing to accept my obsessive thoughts and my compulsive urges, I, they wouldn't control me the same way. Because with OCD, the way it works is there's an unwanted thought. In my case, that unwanted thought would be I'm making a mistake or I'm making the wrong decision. That produces anxiety. To get rid of that anxiety, you engage in repetitive behavior. For someone else, that might be hand washing. For me, it would be making reversing decisions. So I understood that if I was willing to simply sit with my unwanted thoughts and anxiety, I would find some degree of freedom. I wouldn't have to continue engaging in these compulsive behaviors, trying to get rid of the unwanted thoughts because I'd be allowing them in. But I wasn't able to actually engage in that acceptance until I had the experience of doing so with psychedelics. To be more specific, I was first on psychedelics that I had the experience of simply sort of watching my thoughts and my emotions rather than identifying with them. And when I was able to do, and over numerous trips by being able to learning essentially how to do that when I was under the influence of psychedelics, I gradually learned how to do that when I wasn't using psychedelics. And it was, uh, it has, has been life-changing. So it's, it's interesting to see the different levels at which psychedelics can operate on. For some people, it can be more of a cognitive thing. They gain insight into their problems. For other people, it's more of that mystical experience. For some people, it's body awareness has been key for me. So yeah, very, very powerful uh, tools. Um, Can I ask I, you a question? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm curious if microdosing or macrodosing was more effective for the OCD. Yeah, I've not found microdosing helpful. Now, when I did, when I was undertaking this, this was this was years ago before the microdosing thing really became um, more prominent. I mean, I was aware of it, so I, I did not try microdosing during the period of time I recount in the mushroom cure. 
And the OCD is a lot better, but I would not identify myself as cured. The show is called The Mushroom Cure because it's the story of me trying to find this cure. But ultimately, while the OCD is a lot better, it's still, it's it's much less of an issue in my life, but it can flare up from time to time. So I, I continue to work with psychedelics, albeit much less frequently. And I have dabbled with microdosing, both uh, mushrooms and LSD. And I didn't like either of them. I didn't find it. I didn't find it um, helpful, and I had trouble finding a useful dose. It felt like if I took enough that I felt the effects, it actually seemed, for me, it was unpleasant having very mild psychedelic effects. I'm used to more of the macro dose where you're kind of taken by the experience. And if I dosed at a level where there were no perceptible effects, I didn't notice any changes. So I wasn't. I didn't stick with it for that long, but I didn't find it that helpful. Having talked with a lot of people with OCD and other mental challenges, let's say, I, I know people who have found microdosing to be very, very helpful for depression. I've only met one person who feels that it was helpful for OCD. But again, this is very unscientific anecdotal data. And I think this highlights one of the reasons why it's so important that there's a continued... Um, loosening of legal restrictions, as well as just more, more research, because we need to do so much more research on this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of, there's probably more research, I guess, has happened in the last two years that happened in the 10 years before, but it's still a, a drop in the bucket compared to what we're seeing for traditional pharmaceuticals. So, um, yeah, and I, I had one follow-up question for you, Danielle, and then, uh, and then we can quickly turn it over for maybe one or two audience questions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this whole idea of replacing the war on drugs with education and community, which is a broad, um, sort of a, a, a broad um, structure or way of looking at it. I mean, how does that actually come into play in your mind? Yeah, I, I truly believe that, um, getting to a point where we're, we're not using coercion as a means of um, control. We're, you know, with the drug war, you, you get in trouble if you do something that's not in alignment with the law. And that's just creating uh, problems of coercion and punishment within our society and, con and um, contributing to the war. And also I'm, I'm really excited about the uh, the FDA, you know, working on uh, uh, the trials with MDMA and psilocybin. I think that's incredible. But at the same time, are we working towards decriminalizing those substances as well? So, um, or are we just creating a monopoly for the um, organizations that are going through the FDA process, where they will have be the only ones to access it? Um, for example, uh, Compass Pathways is working on um, uh, getting FDA approval for mushrooms. Excellent, awesome. There's going to be people that are going to be able to go to their doctor and get prescribed psilocybin. At the same time, um, can people still grow their own medicine and access their own healing? What if they can't afford a doctor? They don't have insurance. Um, yeah. Once MDMA is legalized, what if uh, people want to use MDMA on their own and not just be in a, in a clinical office? Uh, are people still going to be punished for that? So I really think finding um, the work I'm I'm interested in is decriminalizing all drugs and finding uh, ways that we can um, not punish people for working with their consciousness. And I'm interested in safe injection sites, the model that they have, um, creating safe spaces where people can feel supported to use medicine and have access and integration, and um, not go to prison for for wanting to heal themselves. That's, that's where I think um, we'll, we'll really feel liberty. And I think that it, it's gonna be, we need a lot of education around this. There's still a lot of fear and stigma around psychedelics as we all know, and understandably, but if we replace uh, coercion and punishment with education and building community around this, I do see that we will um, be on a path for freedom. Yeah, well put. Excellent. Well, I want to allow a little bit of time for audience questions. So I, I've seen a few pop up. I, I, Gail, do you want to uh, do you want to pick some at random or whatever 
whatever. Well, we have we have one question. I don't know if we want the person to ask the question, or I can say um, this question from um, J. S. Suti. I'm not sure how well, we might pronounce that. For, for time, uh, <laughs> since I, I I I know we don't have a ton of time. So he says, I've heard it's important that you have someone with you when you use psychedelics to help you through the experience. So Adam, did you try using with the guide or only on your own? Yeah, so I was at, I, so initially I was, I was using psychedelics, usually Grace, that woman who I, I met at the beginning of the excerpt and is the other main person in the show, which is a completely true story. Um, it, I was taking them with her and then I also was taking them on my own. And I did have some, well, for, as you saw at the end, I called 911 on myself. That's, that's a classic example of something that, uh, of a good reason to have someone there. It doesn't necessarily need to be a guide. I should probably define guide because a, a guide typically refers to someone who is not taking psychedelics themselves or maybe is taking a very small, almost like a homeopathic dose, but whose real function is to, well, guide you through the experience. And there is a underground community of psychedelic guides that I will say is probably more established in the Bay Area than anywhere else. But a guide can also just be a trusted friend or family member. So my, my view, now subsequently, I have worked with guides. I've had two guided journeys uh, actually in the Bay Area in recent years. And um, uh, this may be going against the psychedelic orthodoxy a little bit. I personally don't feel like uh, I've gotten more value from my guided journeys than journeys I've had on my own or with friends. I feel like psychedelics can be, and one concern I sometimes have with the medicalization of psychedelics, and I like what you were saying, Danielle, where people, the idea that people should be able to use this in the context of their choosing, essentially, as long as you're being responsible, you're not, you know, getting behind the wheel of a car, you're not neglecting, caring for your kids, or, you know, you're not driving a forklift, whatever the case is, I feel strongly that people should be able to determine their own context to, to use this stuff. And I've, I've had some very healing experiences in quote unquote recreational contexts at dance parties. I've, uh, I've, I've had ayahuasca ceremonies where I couldn't stop laughing, where it's supposed to be this more serious, heavy thing. So one of the beautiful things about psychedelic and one of the challenging things for someone with OCD, but I think ultimately a lot of their healing comes from the fact that they really can force you to let go of control. And that's why I think I've found the higher dose um, experience is more valuable because at low dose, you can kind of negotiate with the experience, try to manage it or manipulate it. But that's what I try to do too much of anyway. At a high enough dose, you're sort of forced to let go. And sometimes I'd say often what emerges when you let go is very surprising. You're expecting to have this heavy trip where you're gonna you know, try to process your grandmother's death and instead, you find yourself uh, laughing uproariously about the, how, the, how loud the person next to you is breathing or whatever. So, um, I'm getting a little far afield from the question, but I guess what I would say is, well, first of all, I should put this blanket caveat that I'm sure applies to Danielle and Madison as well. None of us are, uh, we're not doctors. We're not saying you should do this stuff. Uh, I think we're passionate about protecting people's rights and, and cognitive liberty. But ultimately, it's a very personal decision to decide where to do psychedelics, if to do psychedelics, with whom, what dose, what medication. And I'm not making any recommendations. My own feeling is that if someone were starting off or had a particular issue they wanted to address, a psychological issue, grief, uh, depression, I would say that, yes, working with a guide is ideal provided that you really, really trust the guide. This is, people ask me questions like this fairly often. What I tell them is that I think it's less important to have a guide who's very experienced with psychedelics, though that is helpful, than it is to have a guide who you trust completely. You need to have someone who you trust completely and also someone who you don't have a conflicted relationship with. So it, I would, I would um, for example, having a spouse guide you could be, they could be the perfect person, but they might not be the right person because you have a very uh, enmeshed relationship and some stuff could come up, come up based on that. Um, similar with a parent. So I think 
there's no downside in having a guide, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience with this. But the last thing I'd say to that is there's no guarantees. You could have a, a, a great guide and still have a challenging experience. And those challenging experiences can ultimately be very healing. Thank you. This is such a great discussion and an important discussion. I'm really grateful to all three of you, Madison Marbelin and uh, Danielle Negrin um, and Adam Strauss and your wonderful show. Everyone's going to be able to have a chance to see the mushroom cure when um, things open up and the marsh opens up again when uh, he'll be on stage uh, here. And um, it, a robust and, and important discussion because we really need to look as you mentioned, to, to the creation of safe spaces for people wanting to heal themselves. And this is um, it was a, a discussion that I'm, I'm so happy that you could have joined with us today. And I want to also announce that next week on Solo Arts Heal, um, when your brain won't cooperate, you have to get creative. We're going to see Rhonda Badanda, The Adventures of a Girl with the Pain in Her Brain, um, in a show written and performed by Rhonda Muzak. And, uh, Sensory processing disorder on the spectrum and autism may be familiar buzzwords these days, but what is it like to actually have one of these processing disorders? Um, Rhonda Badanda answers the question with glowing wit and humor in a story of hope centered around a medical mystery. She's going to share selected scenes from her solo show while in conversation with both the show's director, Gareth Hendy, and a leading expert in brain function, Valerie DeJohn. Um, the discussion is going to focus on Rhonda's experiences handling the hitting learning disability that affected her life since childhood, along with her discovery of a method of sound-based treatment that incorporates the music of Mozart. So that's next week on Solo Arts Heals. And uh, thank you so much again, um, Adam Strauss, and all of you for joining us for this wonderful discussion tonight. And uh, I want to turn it back over to Stephanie to let us know what's coming up on Mars Stream. Well, what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful sh uh, show, Adam, and your Hi. guests. Thank you so much for joining us. I do <clears throat> want to say a little bit of a disclaimer. Make sure everyone's really careful before they try these these things. I know I have one friend who went off her antidepressants to start it, and she got into big trouble. So I just just be careful about what you're doing when you try these things. I'm all for it, but I think I want to just ask that people be careful. Um, also, um, uh, thank you all and keep, we've gotten lots of donations. No donation is too big. No donation is too small. Please support us so we can keep this up. Thank you again to everyone and Come back tomorrow night and see me talk to the amazing Robert Townsend. Come back next week and talk see Rhonda perform and have a panelist and all that. And everyone stay healthy and be in good spirits. Thank you so much for joining us at Marsh Stream.